Leopard geckos are wonderful little lizards, and one of the most commonly kept in captivity. As such, we know an awful lot about caring for them properly, and often for long lifetimes. However, just because they are hardy, adaptable, and easy to keep, does this mean pet keepers in general really know much about their natural history? For example, everybody knows that leopard geckos live in habitats like this. But did you know they also live in habitats like this? It's true. In fact, leopard geckos may be said to be so hardy and such ideal candidates for captivity because they are so adaptable to different environments and climatic conditions. Each species on Earth doesn't exist only in a single habitat. And so here we have a problem. How do we cater to these animals in captivity when we could find two identical individuals in two completely different habitats? The reptile keeping hobby usually refers to leopard geckos as being desert dwelling, dry, nocturnal creatures. And we have usually emulated this by providing captives with what we think that looks like in our minds. Meanwhile, using absolutely no wild habitat data other than seeing what blunt country names are mentioned, such as Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. If one uses only their preconceptions, having never experienced such a country, we may see only rocky deserts in mind. But in truth, there are many forested areas too. And so long as a population of this species is found in one of those, then they will have that country listed under their wild range. There is also the issue that sightings in drier areas could be attributed to more dry adapted species, such as the Iranian fat-tailed gecko, which we do not keep and is more dry adapted. The way we think about and keep captive reptiles is very narrow. Within the hobby, there are a multitude of ways that people keep these geckos from unlit basic racking systems to large naturalistic attempts, and every possible step in between. So what is closer to right? Let's find out. In 2009, Mohammed Sharif Khan, a herpetologist from Pakistan, published a study showing his observations of wild leopard geckos, including habitat images like this, which shows a dried up but certainly not dry and dead riverbed. He notes that they prefer to live in caves and crevices found in rock walls where possible, which go rather deep and appear to retain a fair amount of humidity, being 8 to 33% more humid in entrance resting areas compared to the outside. He also describes the effect of monsoon rains. So these geckos experience times of year with extreme moisture and air humidity of 70 to 80 percent. Khan also mentioned that they were most active in the environment during the humid season, and near-human habitation could be found gathered under leaking pipes. Another study in 2019 by a group of Nepalese researchers discovered a few individuals in Nepal in lush habitat that at times reached as low temperatures as 5 degrees Celsius. They were also found 1.5 meters above the ground within a dead tree. Stark differences to how we usually keep these in captivity. Ben Owens, the director and founder of Captive and Field Herpetology, also has made some incredible wild observations that he has kindly provided to us. While out in India in 2018 and later in 2019 doing brilliant work collecting data on various species, venom research, and educating locals on avoiding and handling snake bites, he came upon a population of leopard geckos. Through DNA work, he later confirmed that these are indeed the same species and the same locality as the geckos we keep as pets, identical to those originally caught for the pet trade. So how did you imagine leopard gecko wild habitat prior to this video? Dry? Sandy and rocky? This is where they were found. Once again, relatively lush habitat with lots of foliage and no small amount of water. 
living in rocky but humid stone walls, with dampened soil below and a lot of biological matter littering the habitat floor. This habitat still has drier areas within, but that is part of what we must focus on so as to improve our captive husbandry. Their wild habitat has a wealth of different microhabitats or microbiomes, where they can and will move between to get what they need at that moment. A huge misunderstanding within this hobby appears to be an assumption that moisture or humidity is a death sentence for any species that could be described as arid. But the real issue there in practice would be the lack of ventilation causing stagnant air and water, and unavoidable humidity. Water isn't the problem, enclosure design is. Another issue is how people have assumed that desert animals survive in habitats that lack water in the wild, assuming that they go long periods without drinking. But this isn't true. Advancing Herpetological Husbandry co-founder Francis Koskiri has noted the following on his experience of desert life. I have stood in the Namib Desert, which can have just 5 millimetres of rain in a year, and been absolutely soaked by fog droplets. Droplets that a great many species in the region have adapted to live off. I have walked at night in North Africa and been wet from night mist. Even with extremely low rainfall and no permanent water features, a desert can still experience morning dew, fog, and mist. Many less hardy species have already shown that this is key to their captive survival. This, of course, doesn't mean that arid reptiles should be provided with foggers or misters, but it does highlight that keeping them in a dry enclosure with no water access except what they can get from food will result in a dehydrated animal. We know that many arid snakes and even bearded dragons will seek out and drink dew off the tips of grasses. Veterinary interventions have also found that many cases of gut impaction in reptiles are in part due to dehydration causing constipation. The mindset that these animals are taking all of their water from their food is dangerous. Francis has long recommended providing at least a small localised humid hide for all reptiles, and does so even for true desert arid dwelling species like his sand snakes and coach whips. Ben Owens elaborates on some more surprising seasonal parts of leopard gecko ranges. He notes finding them at 900 to 1200 metres above sea level, meaning that hot weather can well exceed 30 degrees Celsius but also commonly drops below 20, and an average night temperature of between 8 and 13 Celsius, noting that these areas can even receive snow. People are often afraid to allow temperatures to temporarily drop low like this, but they are capable of handling it in their wild environment. Here is Ben's opinion on how we should think about the husbandry of leopard geckos. I think our captive leopard gecko may actually be so far removed from its wild counterparts that some serious thought and planning would have to go into keeping them in truly naturalistic conditions. To truly do so, and I believe this is true of pretty much all species, our enclosure sizes would need to be significantly larger, so we could provide damp areas alongside drier areas which don't remain too stagnant when we aren't providing hot temperatures. I say this because I would, off the top of my head, say that it's cool and damp two thirds of the time, and hot dry days come in blocks of one or two days for the remaining third of time. The rains these forests receive, especially during monsoons, are almost rain forest level, and that moisture is around all of the year. Even though we have been keeping them for decades, I think there is a wealth of knowledge to be gained about not only this little species, but also the ecology that we could apply to every other species in captivity. An interesting and thought-provoking note Ben also makes is his observation of the other fauna in their habitat. Very few insects, but lots of frogs, 
tadpoles, and small geckos of various species. Given the size difference, Ben's hypothesis is that these, especially the geckos, may make up a lot more of their diet than we might first realise, and thinks that this information may also contribute to the prevalence of metabolic bone disease in captivity, as wild gecko tissues and organs will contain some small amount of vitamin D, supplementing their exposure of usually about or below 1 UVI. Not that we would recommend feeding lizards to your pet leopard geckos, but this could show a need for more thought into UV exposure and supplementation. So, what we can take from all of this is that reptiles are not always restricted to one type of habitat. So, how we can best care for them currently is to provide enclosures as large as we can, with a huge gradient going from warm to cool, dry to damp and humid, from bright to dark, and from areas of stronger UV to a small amount and none, with lots of varied clutter to experience the largest range of conditions possible, just like they would in the wild. Please check out and support Ben's amazing work over at Captive and Field Herpetology, where you can learn a ton about the unspoken problem of snake bites in the countries he visits. Thank you for watching, and please never stop learning. Thank you.